Hello, Moto America fans. This is Paul Carruthers. I'm the communications manager for Moto America, and this is our weekly podcast off track with Carruthers and Vice. As I mentioned, I'm Carruthers, and Sean Vice is across the country in Ohio. He's my partner in crime on these shows weekly. And Sean, this is our 200th episode. And I, it's funny enough, yesterday I read a story, the average podcast lasts for 13 episodes and the plug is either pulled by them or somebody else. Wow. So no we, 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 are, we are in the top level of excellence as far as I'm concerned. I think you're right. I mean, I can't believe it. I can't believe it's 200. I know it seems like when we got to, I don't know, around 189, 190, it seems like we've done about 40 of them since then. But at any rate, at any rate, here we are. And, you know, we're going to, we'll get to our guest in a second, but we chose this guy to be on this episode because he, I can say this, right, Paul, you're okay if I just reveal this? Yeah, I can say that. He is the number one podcast we've ever done he's the most popular podcast um we've had him on a couple of times i think it was the last one that we did with him that was the most popular is that right yeah it was the last one yeah so we're like okay when we have the 200th we need to chase down and get the ever elusive garrett gerloff on i just revealed it paul sorry um I couldn't contain myself um, but obviously people that tune in already know the guest is that anyway. So I don't know why I act like it's a big surprise. But anyway, Garrett is not an easy guy to get a hold of. I don't know if he's ever been easy to get a hold of, but man, he's even harder now. And I talk to the the people that I know who can help us with that, um, including his mom. And his mom did help me. Um, thankfully, I have a good relationship with her. So usually when I ask her to help me with something, she's good. But but credit credit the man himself for coming on here. And he we caught him just before he's heading back over to Europe, I think on Monday um, for the next round of the uh, 2022, what do they call it? FIM World Superbike Championship. I think uh, there's a brand involved in there too, but I don't have to worry about it because they don't sponsor our series. So uh, we'll just talk about World Superbike. But but uh, yeah, Paul, it's kind of cool. But before we get him on here, let's talk a little bit. We got two rounds to go. Uh, big deal coming up, not this weekend, but the weekend after this long weekend that we're having. And it's in New Jersey and it's coming down to the wire for Superbike. But certainly the, the uh, championship is going to be decided for the Mission King of the Baggers and probably super sport as well. And maybe even stock one, you lost the stock 1000. So it's going to be a big weekend coming up. You're excited. I'm sure. Yeah, it's going to be cool. It's uh, the champ uh, super bike championship. There's only one point uh, between uh, the two Gagne and Petrucci. And I actually did a little research because I'm like, that's gotta be the closest one we've ever had with four races left to go. But in 2015, um, Cameron Bobier and Josh Hayes were actually tied in points with four to go. We all know how that turned out. Uh, it ended up with Cameron in New Jersey, which was the last race of the year that season, uh, ended up beating, um, he, didn't, he didn't actually beat Hayes. Hayes won both the races at New Jersey, but Cameron didn't really need to. So they, he, had, he ended up beating him by four points. And that was Cameron's first of what would become five uh, Moto America Superbike Championships. So it's, it's kind of cool. We actually have, it seems like we have more history at New Jersey for some reason than anywhere else. And obviously because, you know, the championship, it's always towards the end of the championship and sometimes at the very end and, you know, we get champions that are crowned there. As you mentioned, um, we will definitely have one of our champions crowned because the, the uh, Mission King of the Baggers series actually ends at, uh, at New Jersey this or next weekend. So that championship will be sh for sure be to be decided. Those guys are only a couple of points apart. It's really down to two of them, which is Tyler O'Hara and Travis Wyman. So yeah, it's it's going to be a pretty exciting and, and busy weekend for us. And there'll be you know some number one plates handed out by the AMA at the uh, at the conclusion of it. But it should be cool. Yeah, it's going to be great. Looking forward to it. So now we can change our tune a little bit and talk about World Superbike Racing. Although Garrett always likes to talk about Moto America as well because he's. He's a good boy and he likes Moto America, but uh, he's currently, let's see, 12th in the World Superbike Championship. Um, uh, I'm sure he's going to tell us that he he's, hasn't had a very good season and uh, things could be better, but he's got six rounds to go. And as we know, 
there's always the possibility of turning things around. They go to France next week. Like I said, six more rounds and a lot of things can happen in six rounds. And it's the last races that people seem to remember more so than the early ones. So Garrett, um, I'm sure you're going into, uh, is it Le Mans? Oh, dude, you know how hard it is to hold your breath for that long? <laughs> <laughs> you need to hold your breath. We well, oh, you, you be quiet. Oh, be quiet. There's no mute button on here. Like, you don't breathe like Darth Vader or anything. I mean, what's that sound? <laughs> His mouth breathing. Uh, no, it's not Lamont, uh, Paul. Come on, dude. Magni Core. You don't know this? Magni Core. Yeah, there we go. Hey, back in my day, it would be Paul Ricard. So, great. Dude, great. I'd love to go there again. I rode there last year on a stock bike, and that place was, was pretty epic, especially that straightaway that just goes yeah. on forever. I was on the stock bike on the limiter for five to eight seconds uh, in sixth gear. It was crazy. It's funny, the first press introduction I ever did with Cycle News, I was just a kid, 24, something, 25, and Yamaha took us to France, <clears throat> and we did some street bike riding, street riding, and then, um, and then we went to Paul Ricard for a day, or maybe it was two days, so that was my first real, like, track experience, so it was a little bit intimidating, but I figured it out, but that straightaway, you could have a cup of tea on the way down there and still be fine to make that. I guess it's that fast ride at the end, but no, it's definitely yeah. a good place. No, it's ridiculous. And like around there, that area, it actually would be pretty sick to go ride just the R1 around the, around the streets, like around there by the beach and stuff. Yeah, you like go down to Bandol and that mountain road is crazy that goes from the track down to the beach there. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Had my van there. I had my sketchy van from last year and <laughs> no. uh, the brake pads were down to damn near nothing. So they heated up pretty quick and uh, I had some brake fade that, you know, kind of puckered me a little, <laughs> a little bit, a couple of times. So cool. I have a story from that road and I, I, I wasn't very smart to, to make this actually happen, but I ended up in a rent a car with Kenny Roberts going from uh, the beach, going from Bandol up to the track. And I was literally petrified. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's just getting you warmed up for the for the uh, racetrack, you know. Yeah, like getting that mindset. <laughs> hey, Garrett, hey, Garrett, did I see on social media that you have you have an R one street bike? I saw a black you with a black street bike. I thought Is that right. Uh, no, I I don't post on social media, uh, and no, I don't have uh, I don't have a R one or anything. I have a scooter. I have I uh, an X Max. I think on Facebook story. I'm telling you, I saw it. Maybe you were just with a, somebody else's bike or something, but it was definitely a street bike. Oh, 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 yeah, no, okay, I, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, that was um, I went out to L.A. and I was uh, I was there. I was close to you guys actually. Oh, well, that was with HKC, Paul. and you didn't call yeah. me. I remember. Yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> it was last minute, and it was a twenty-four hour turnaround, dude. All right. And I could I couldn't change the flight because I didn't make them. So anyway, uh, but yeah, we got to go around uh we were on the paula racetrack like around like the yeah paula, palomar, I think. Track. yeah yeah palomar yeah exactly around there and it was pretty it was pretty badass we did some cool stuff for hjc for some new helmets they got coming out that i'm not going to talk about but they were super nice uh and i got pretty a little bit sketchy wearing jeans uh out there on some public wow. roads and uh it's a rush i tell you what i understand why people go out and go fast, you know, on a street bike on the road because it is a rush. So were you just pretending you were Josh Heron? <laughs> I was trying to, but I, dude, I can't, I can't slide it. I hate to admit it, but I can't slide it. I, I'm gonna blame it on the ABS, but anyway, it's still tough. <laughs> are you good, Garrett? Are you good with wheelies on the street? I mean, you got a wheelie if you're Josh Heron. So, do you do that? Oh man, uh. I can. I have. I have in the past. I didn't when I was out there because the last thing I want to do is have all these nice, expensive cameras around me and just to get every angle of me looping it out. So uh, I, I refrained. But uh, I, there's a video that I have from back in the day. It had to have been 2014, and I was on my dad's uh, FC09, the the triple that Yamaha make, and I, I actually bought it for him for his birthday, yeah. and I did a wheelie across there's a road up here uh in north houston it's 1097 and it goes across uh, across lake conroe and i wheel it across that whole thing in shorts and a t-shirt and uh and a helmet no gloves like no boots or nothing and i saw that video the other day 
And I was just, my palms started sweating. I was like, dude, what was I doing? Cause I was even more of a squid back then than I am now. And for sure, I, I was this close to, to just giving it a little bit too much gas and, and flipping that thing. And I, all, I was just, everything that could have happened, like me just flipping down the road with no gear on, I was like, dude, what are you doing? So <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm happy to report that my frontal cortex is fully developed now. That's good. <laughs> well, so you know whose frontal cortex not, may not be fully, fully developed? Uh, well, there are a He's lot Sean. of them. <laughs> but no, you're, <laughs> cy- you're, cycling, you're cycling, buddy. I think he's still your cycling buddy. Bobby Fong claims he can't do a wheelie, although we see him do wheelies all the time. Have you ever heard him say that to you? No, I haven't, but I did just see him not too long ago out in Utah, yeah. of all places. Yeah, we saw you on the cycle. And well, you probably, I don't know, does you ever see him do a wheelie on a mountain bike or, you know? <laughs> He says he can't wheel it. Yeah, I, again, dude. That's uh, when you're around people that you respect. You don't. You don't try to look like an idiot. Uh, and I would have looped out a mountain bike too. So I just I kept it on two wheels, and he did too, I guess. And I saw what you did to Patchy's elbow. Oh yeah. I would, no, 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 no. I already <laughs> left by then. I was gone. I because I, I I knew I was there for three days, and they were trying to get me to stay another day. I was like, there's no way I'm staying another day because I know that it's like. Three days is my maximum, and then I know the fourth day I'm gonna go end over end, and uh, and so I yeah I called it and I flew back home. <laughs> good good move. That's a good move. Well, yeah, I mean, no. Paul, that thing he he had a bit, he had like a wrap around his elbow. We looked at it, and then he showed us those pictures. And exactly. I was like, what are you in a slaughterhouse? I mean, what, what the hell I happened there? I could have done without the pictures, actually. <laughs> yeah, crazy. I don't know. It did. It did look deep and and wide <laughs> uh but then i saw a photo of it like a week later and it damn near looked healed so i don't know what he's what he's you know what he's got over there but it's working glued it he used glue or something yeah. elmer's a little bit of elmer's he didn't even get stitches he just put glue on it and then wrapped it and yeah i was surprised that it looked as good as it did but maybe it'll fall off when he's old <laughs> i mean when you're old you don't need two arms really no i can get by with one yeah, I just wanted to push you up off the couch. <laughs> hey, Garrett, um, I gotta. So, I gotta. I gotta go back in time here because listen, I've done this before with you. But since we are racing next weekend at New Jersey Motorsports Park, I cannot forget the first time I ever met you in 2011 when this kid with a short haircut shows up for, in Super Sport for Chuck Graves at New Jersey Motorsports Park Saturday sets the provisional poll who is this kid it was garrett gerloff do you have fond memories in new jersey motorsports park because of that uh dude i it's like i can't believe how long ago that was that was you know 11 years ago yeah um yeah i i know the track was a lot better back then (laughs) uh it seems like it gets bumpier every year and you know grip goes away a little bit but uh yeah it's definitely a throwback i I've hit my head so many times that I like remember being there, but the whole atmosphere and everything, like it just, it's just slipping away already. So it's not looking good for me in the next few years. <laughs> well, you know, it's possible that, that that first ride you had in New Jersey has been overshadowed by, I do remember that one year. I don't remember what exact year it was. If it was the year that you guys ro- rode the, uh, the 60th anniversary black and yellow bikes, but you and you and uh, JD had that like um, whatever it was uh, uh, coordinated crash in that one turn on I think it was Caroline Olson's oil oil or something and it was in the rain right I mean that was that was a yeah weird... yeah yeah that wasn't that wasn't great that uh, actually JD's bike hit me in the back of the leg and it like tore something and did not feel good uh, I but yeah that. no I do I do have some good memories I remember like Cameron and I lied not last year twenty nineteen on the super bikes, we had a, a pretty good race there, uh, in race one. And like, so that's a good memory. I got to ride the super bike there for the second time at Jersey. That was super cool. Uh, yeah. First race. I won my championship there. Uh, one of them. Yeah. One of them, the first one in 16. So I definitely got some good memories there, but to be fair, I got a lot of good memories at, at most of the tracks I go to luckily. 
Yeah, you do. And in fact, let's point out the fact that the round we finish out like we often do and almost always do at, uh, well, we used to end up at New Jersey, but now we're mostly going to Barber to finish out. And we know how you feel about that track. Having lived for part of your life in Trustville, Alabama, in that area, we know Barber Motorsports Park is a favorite track of yours. Would, would that be correct to say that? Yeah, definitely. I love that place, especially since they repaved it. Like, I, I don't know how it is now after a few years, but uh it's like especially the last year in 19 when we were there it was it was epic and i've been pushing super hard like trying to tell as many donut people as as i can like can we please go back to the u.s somewhere anywhere and i keep saying barber because i think it would be uh i think it'd be cool it's a it's a super unique track um it's got like probably the nicest facility we go to um and you know it's decently well located for anybody coming from europe to the u.s like it's on that side on the east coast which is good uh what else i don't know i i i, I need to make like a slideshow or something so i can i can present that a little bit better but uh <laughs> you well, know the, i think it'd be yeah, epic you you remember too i mean i don't probably you've heard josh hayes say this the one thing about that track is it's an absolutely perfect track but it feels like somebody put it in a copy machine and reduced it in size 75 percent. do you think that track's big enough for a world superbike event you you would know better than us obviously yeah i mean i, th I think it is uh i think the biggest thing well the biggest thing that i hear is that is the garage situation which is something that i started thinking about more and it is true like a lot of the tracks that we go to in the u.s they don't have garages on pit lane which is how every single track in europe is set up and even you know like phillip island and some other places around the world um and so yeah it's just something i didn't even think about that we need the garages on pit lane for to be able to accommodate the championship you know just how it kind of set up and and run uh like laguna sega had it luckily um coda has it but not too many other ones do so i guess there's that aspect um and i think there's something to do with a straightaway uh minimum that's required but i don't know i'm talking about stuff that i don't know about so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know that it meets all the requirements garrett do you do you do you pay attention enough to moto america i know you look at the results and you kind of know what's going on but do you go as far as like when i'm when i'm writing a lot of these previews it, you still have super sport lap records at some of these places does that surprise you i uh, I mean, yeah, I guess it does kind of surprise me, but I'll take it. I'll definitely take it. I mean, but when and when it was JD and I and like Valentin Davies and uh, I mean, who else did we have back in the day? I, like I said, I hit my head too many times, but uh, we had some pretty epic, epic battles and we were pushing each other, each other uh, like you wouldn't believe. And I got uh, somewhat of a competitive bone in my body and I don't like it in beat. So it kind of helps to push even farther than you want to go <laughs> and, and it makes you go fast okay so so speaking of getting beat god that sounds horrible didn't it yeah i was about to say but, but talk to us a little bit about this year like i don't know if you're frustrated you're not frustrated i have a feeling you are frustrated i don't i, I can see why what give us a little catch up on on what's going on with you and 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 the championship that you're racing for yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely frustrated. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that's, that's going on, but, uh, I know, I, I know that I can be higher up than what, what I've been doing this year. And like I said, there's been a variety of things going on, like in the background, let's say, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I'm not happy. I'm definitely not happy with, with my results. Um, and I know they can be better. And slowly but surely, we're we're getting there. Um, there's been there was quite a big, a big change that was made for Moss uh, that I can't really go into detail uh, about, but it was something that really helps me a lot, and will be on the bike for the rest of the season, and uh, something that I didn't have on the bike in the first half of the season. So, uh, but it definitely is is a big step, and I like it was kind of shown in race two. Uh, getting closer to the top five i mean that's what the most frustrating thing is it's like you know the last couple of years i've been on the the podium and stuff so that's realistically where i know i can be um and you know hopefully win a race at some point but this year's just been just been a struggle and you know i'm a fighter like i'm not gonna quit uh but it, it has been difficult and i one of the things that's made it difficult also is just the level of the top guys it is 
just ridiculous how much faster the top three are going than than last year. So like one of the stats I like to to say um, is last year at Donington race two, uh, I got second place and I had a certain race time. I can't remember what the race time was, but I did the same race time in race one of this year at Donington. So the same race time that got me on the podium last year, I did in race one at Donington this year and wow. got seventh place and was 17 seconds behind the winner. Wow. So like year over year, there was a 15 second improvement uh, from race winner to, to race winner, 15 seconds. I mean, that's, that's damn near uh, a second a lap. And that, that like, that uh, jump in performance from one year to the next is definitely unheard of. And, and it's been like that in it, basically every track we've gone to. Every track we've gone to, it's been like, I think anywhere from seven seconds to 16 seconds faster than the year before. And yeah, that's, that's also been something that's been difficult to kind of uh, deal with a lot because of other things I've been struggling with on the bike. But anyway. Okay, I think we know each other well enough and we like each other enough that I can ask you this, but when I watch you race, I see that you qualify fairly well, you know, anywhere from fifth to 10th. And <clears throat> I watch you, I, I specifically watch you because you're our guy and I watch you lead the start line and I don't think you're as aggressive in the first couple of corners and even the entire first lap as you once were. Now we know the issues you had and, and, and it's probably natural that you are less aggressive than you were, but is that the case or is that just me not knowing what I'm looking at? No, I mean, I'm still, I'm still giving it my all and uh, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to put myself in, in positions to, to make passes and to, and to, to move forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been, it just hasn't like some, sometimes just, things just don't work out. They just don't work out. Like it's not like I'm doing anything different in my head. Uh, but just the result at the end of the day, even like in the first couple corners, like I just end up going backwards and it, it is like frustrating for sure. Um, but no, I mean, I, I feel like I'm giving it my all like always. All right. And Lamont, I want you to just, Oh no, Magni cores. I just want you to send it in turn one. Okay? Come on, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, that's Maggie, what you dude. Matt, you just, Matt, he's got just, turn five. Turn five is what, like 200 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour? Yeah, that's, good that's a good one to send it. To make up ground if you want. <laughs> All right, just so, do it here for me. I'll be watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the camera up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Garrett, help us understand something. Is, is, is Top Rex and Locatelli's R1 different than yours? I, I mean, yeah, I, there's always going to be differences because we have different sponsors. Like, so let's say rear sets, we have different manufacturers for that. Uh, he has a different throttle than I do um, because of sponsorship stuff. So like sponsorship, for sponsorship reasons, there will be different parts on our bikes. Um, but no, I mean, like contractually, I'm supposed to have the same bike, the same major components uh, as the factory team. So, okay. Yeah. All right, so let me give you let me give you something to compare that to or with. So in our series, and this may have even been the case when you were racing, uh, maybe not actually because it wasn't Richard Stan Bully then. But Richard has this billet swing arm that he crafts out of billet aluminum, and it's something that he keeps to himself. It's on uh, Cam Peterson's bike and Jake Gagne's bike, and Matthew Skoltz covets that that billet swing arm like nobody's business and i think it's gotten it it gets to the point where sometimes he thinks oh that's going to be a difference maker for for him and i know he felt that way about the electronics a couple of years ago and they until they finally got the full suite and i think it did come to pass that it certainly helped him but in his head he's got this thing about if i had that swing arm i would i would be doing what they're doing or that bike now, of course, there this there are ones, but they're not the same. So, to the point, I'm asking you, and you saying about certain components, is it possible that there's some things on that those two bikes or on Top Rack's bike that if you had on your bike, maybe maybe it would help? No, because there's nothing there's nothing that I perceive to be better <laughs> as better, okay. you know, on his bike than mine. I mean, if we're talking, if I'm complaining about the foot not having the same footrest, and that's why I'm going a second a lap slower during the race, then. I, do, I think there's some more self-awareness that needs to happen on my part. 
Right. Um, so so it, there's not no. like a swing arm difference or anything. There's nothing major like that. No, not right now. Not right now. Um, but you guys ask me questions that I, I can't answer. So uh, no, you that's know. okay. Come it's about time. And and listen, there's gonna yeah, be more. <laughs> we're gonna ask you some more that you're not gonna be able to answer too. But this one, let me Bring ask on, you. This. Dude. Let me, yeah, exactly. Let's let's ask you this about Coda Nizani. Is his bike the same as yours? Uh yeah, I mean it's supposed to be. They look the same, at least, you know. Okay. I'm just going around, you know, looking, looking, and they, they look the same to me, but I'm definitely no engineer. Blue. Or, they're all like, blue. Yeah. They're blue. They got black wheels. Oh, wait, no, they have blue wheels. Sorry. All right. Back that up. They got blue wheels, black tires, uh, yellow suspension. Yeah. No, I got the, I got the basics covered. <laughs> so, so let me, let me ask you this. And this is coming. I, I mentioned this to you offline. I really appreciate what your team does as far as PR and information, they give a lot of good information. Your quotes are good. They even sound like you, by the way. And uh, their photos cool. of you are really good. And I always get them and, and turn them into stories for the Moto America website and social media. So we like to cover you. It's kind of the, the situation has worked out where Paul kind of covers, you know, Joe, uh, Cameron, and uh, uh, Sean Dylan Kelly. And I focus on you and occasionally on if Baz does something just because he's braced in our series before. Um, but with that said, and, and all that information out there, help me to understand something that I uh, gravitate towards. And it's the independent rider uh, status. You were number one independent rider last year. And I felt like that was a big deal. Um, this year, I know that Alex Bassani is doing a really good job. Is, is independent rider, number one independent rider, important to that team? Is it important to you? Does it mean something in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, the, the, everybody's out there trying to do the best they can. And every team has something that they want to prove. Obviously the factory teams, they have that, uh, that support from, from the factory directly, but also us, we have a ton of support from Yamaha and, uh, and Felipe, my team owner, he's the man. He's, uh, he has so much passion for, for racing. And, you know, we also have the independent podium on, uh, for the races and stuff. And that's definitely where we want to be. I mean, if, if nothing else, like we, we want to be, uh, right there as best independent team um, during during the race, but also, you know, at the end of the year. And I was happy to be able to give that to them last year through everything. Um, and yeah, like this year, I mean, I know we can be doing, I know we can be getting on uh, on our, on that podium more at the very least, but uh, yeah, just been, just been tough, but uh, that's what, that's where you get motivation, you know, things aren't going your way, just uh, should fire you up to, to work even harder. Well, it seems like the dynamic in your team is really cool. It seems like, you know, all those people are really good from, from the PR person, like I said, all the way down through. And um, yeah, yeah. And no, I love those guys. Those guys are the best. Like dude, they've, uh, we've all, we've been through a ton. We've been, uh, we've been through like a, a bunch of highs and a decent amount of lows. And, and like, I feel the support from them all the way. And, you know, I, I try to give back to them as much as I can with, with, uh, well, not just results, but just anything, anything that I can do. Um, I, I definitely consider all of them to be my friends and stuff and, and coming showing up to the track and, and seeing those guys like faces and stuff. It's uh, it always is like uh, uh, brightens the day, you know? So, uh, so yeah. And, it, and I want to give them the best results I can. And so I was happy to at least get that independent championship last year. Yeah. And that, that's the thing, because, you know, I know it was like that back here in the States in Moto America, you were on a, you were in a family and had been for a long time. And you seem to be in that kind of family atmosphere. Now, um, regarding your teammate, it seems like he's held at a different standard than you are. Um, and I think I'm going to guess some of it's because he's comes from Yamaha, Japan. So there's some involvement there. Um, his results to my knowledge, are never better than yours or have never been better than yours. And I'm not trying to diss the guy at all. I don't know him. I think he's probably a good teammate to you. But it seems like the fact that you outperform him all the time doesn't seem to doesn't seem to count for anything. I don't understand it. Can you explain I don't know, it? but, but uh, dude, I freaking, I love that guy. He's the, he's the man. He's, he's the best. He's crazy <laughs> on the side. Like, he's crazy. <laughs> uh but like he's so fun to hang out with and like we'll go and get food and stuff like on the race weekends just me and him and we're using google translate quite a bit but just the translations that i get from him after like asking him some stupid question the translation i get back and and like what he tells me like dude he's he's crazy <laughs> so i do like the guy a lot um yeah but 
dude, he starts like he starts like JD Beach. Like I, he freaking he can get the best start of everybody on the grid like every time. And so it doesn't matter how far up on the uh, on the grid I am compared to him, the guy's passing me in turn one, <laughs> or he's he's right behind me like on the first lap. And, uh, and yeah, it definitely annoys me sometimes, but, uh, but no, he's a, he's a good dude. Yeah, he seems to be, and I didn't know if the language barrier was tough for you. And I've heard you say before about, about him. And I, I know, I know how it, that that's gotta be tough for him. He's been on the team for a couple of years now, so that's good to hear. And I know you always had an interesting dynamic with JD. You guys were, were close and teammates, but you know, he, you used to drive each other crazy every once in a while on the track. And it makes sense. The first one you want to beat is your teammate. So that's understandable. But it's good to hear about the culture within that team and how that feels. So with that said, I'm going to ask you a question here. I don't speak Italian. I can't read Italian. The translations on the Internet are not real good. But I did hear from a very close friend of mine who who Italian is his first language. And you know him, too. Garrett quite well. He used to work with you a lot. And he has told me that he has read in the Italian press that you're going to a Kawasaki team next year. And I said, not Petercini. He goes, no, Puccetti. Uh, can you confirm or deny, as they say in the media? Oh, oh, oh. oh man. All, all I know is that uh, Italians, they do like to talk. Uh, you know, they do, they do like to say stuff they don't know. Right. Um, but uh, no, I can neither confirm nor deny. That is an interesting rumor, though. It's not the only rumor that I've heard going around. Um, but that's why I love my manager, because I just throw everything to him. And I say, hey, don't bother me, because I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing. And he says, no problem, and comes to me every once in a while with, uh, with details about what could or, you know, what might or might not happen. So, um, so my manager knows a hell of a lot more than I do. Um, but like I said, I'm happy with, uh, with what I'm doing, with where I'm at. It's been getting better. And uh, I do like my Yamaha, I'm not going to lie. Well, I mean, so, you think about how long you've been involved in Yamaha, longer than you were a professional road racer. You raced a Yamaha even when you were an amateur, I believe. You ha I know you had a Morawaki, yeah, yeah. but you were yeah. a Yamaha way back. And been a Yamaha guy since 2011, since 2011. So it's yeah. been, been 11 years. And uh, so was, you that's know. right. You were in Weir that year before you went to, that's right. It was earlier that year. You were on a Graves bike before you turned pro at, uh, at New Jersey. Gotcha. So it was 2011, long time. It's a family. Your team's a family. It would be pretty shocking. So my question to you is with regard to having conversations with manage your management, um, do you, do you give any kind of a, I don't know, a nod or a discount to, to the family, so to speak, does Yamaha get an inside track? on this stuff a nod or a discount i i that's i'm using a phrase so let me tell you what this is i should have told you this i'm oh, also God. so in free agency some football some guys will go into free agency and they'll get an offer from another team and they'll say no i want to stay on this team so i won't make as much going to it as i would go into a different team but i like where i am i'm going to stay where i'm at so they call that sometimes a quote family discount in 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 my gotcha. question is like do you do you weigh heavily into it the the fact that you're kind of been with yamaha so long that's really what the question is gotcha gotcha i mean how how long is it for uh for common law marriage is that seven years <laughs> I think it probably is. Most most things are that seven year statute of limitation. Is it, is it statute? All right, seven years. Well, we've been together for eleven, so it looks like we're gonna be stuck with each other for a while now. <laughs> just, How's that for an answer? You just Look, made I'm, my I'm, wallet. Like, you, guys are, you guys are training me pretty well to be a politician one day. You know, good. so you're probably not gonna you're probably not gonna tell us that 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 rumor of you coming back to race baggers is true either. Then. <laughs> Well, I mean, try me, bro. Uh, I mean, I was with Bobby Fong earlier this, this month, and we did talk for quite a bit, so you never know. You know what we call him now? Bagger Bob. Bagger Bob. Yeah, and it's Bagger actually Bob. Gained, it's gained some momentum, and I think it's going to stick, so make sure you use that one. He told me that uh, he's got a special item of his that he keeps in one of the bags on the back. I don't know if you guys happen to know what it is. Uh, I, wow. with, him, with him, I wouldn't even want to guess. No, yeah, I, I, you wouldn't tell me, so I, I can only imagine. But I'm just leaving it out there for everybody to think about. <laughs> we'll have to sneak. We'll have to sneak a look. Yeah, you're gonna have to pop one open. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if it goes through tech like that. 
<laughs> I don't know. I just wouldn't want to have an x-ray machine, I don't think, uh, to actually see what's in there. <laughs> well, you know, one of the, I do know one of the bikes actually has a stuffed toy of a taco, in it, and, it's, and it's the Indian, um, because I think it might have been his crew chief that showed it. No, what am I thinking? That was uh, SNS. That's Tyler O'Hara's got that in his bag. <laughs> so who knows what they carry in those damn things, so... Um, I don't know, but that that could go a couple different ways. <laughs> yeah, well, you are right about that. Um, Garrett, this is a question I have for you that isn't, well, sometime in your career, let's put it that way. And I'm not talking about next year. You've got a lot still going on and all this. Would you ever would you ever come back and race in Moto America or will it depend on how things go and what what happens? I mean, do you ever miss Moto America? Dude, yeah, I, I miss all of you guys. Like, I miss being at the at the track. I miss being around, you know, other Americans sometimes. You know, it happens. Uh, and I miss the tracks that, that we used to go to, like that whole family. Like, for sure, I miss I miss being in Moto America. Um, and, yeah, I, I love motorcycles. So if I have an opportunity to ride somewhere, uh, whether it's, it could be anywhere, uh, I want to I wanna be on a motorcycle as long as, as, long as I can. So, yeah. Um, if it's here for a couple more years, if it's back in Moto America, that'd be sweet. Uh, I actually went to a BSB round not too long ago uh, at Brands Hatch, and that championship looks pretty wild, uh, especially with, like, the rules they have. No TC and, and the right. tracks that they, they ride look ridiculous. So, I mean, that's cool. Maybe one of these days, like, do, uh, do a couple rounds at BSB or something like that. But, no, I just want to keep riding as, as long as I can. Well, listen, if you go anywhere, go to Cadwell Park and jump the mountain because that's all. I mean, that thing's ridiculous. I, I saw it. I saw Top Rack and Locatelli. They were there. Yes. I don't know yes. if Locatelli jumped it, but uh, but Top Rack jumped it. And everybody was uh, – I mean, it is it is pretty wild for sure. And it must there must be like some dynamic to it that makes it even weirder on a street bike because nobody could believe that he jumped it after three laps. And I mean, yeah, nice. yeah. I ride motocross. I just rode motocross today. And uh, – <laughs> Like, I don't know, you just jump it, but I, but I could be wrong. There could be something, there could be something to it that makes it way weirder on a street bike. I don't know, but I'd, I'd love to go one day and, and check it out. What Garrett, what did you do to your leg and are you okay now? Uh, oh, from earlier this year. Yes. Uh, yeah. So at Estoril, I had a crash, a weird one. Um, so like normally when you high side, you land on your back for the most part. That's been my experience. Uh, but I had a high side around the last corner, which is third gear going like a hundred miles an hour at, at, uh, at least. Uh, and I landed on my hands and my, my elbows and knees, and I was going kind of perpendicular with my, uh, my, uh, direction of travel to the track. And so when my knees and elbows touched down, I had like my, my knees, my knee protection rotate. And the leathers opened up a bit uh, because like, obviously the, the protection rotated and I was on the seams instead of like where it should have been. And uh, I just had a, a hole ground down in my knee, down to the, to the bone. So that you could see like oh. the, the kneecap and the side of my, the side of my femur a little bit. It wasn't like crazy big. I'm looking at it right now. It's probably the size of a, like a half dollar, um, but it was definitely deep and didn't feel great. Uh, but I, they wouldn't let me race for because of an infection risk right uh, apparently um uh, even though i was taking like antibiotics and stuff so i don't really know i i was hoping that i could go out there and, and like try at least because that weekend started off pretty well but uh yeah in the end i wasn't let i wasn't allowed to so but it's a, it's a good looking scar right now but it's okay now i mean the joint's okay you don't have any issues yeah, luckily it didn't mess up any anything that had to do with my joints. It was all just cosmetic stuff. And I mean, it doesn't look great right now. And I think my knee braces were wearing on it today because uh, or rubbing on it because it's it's opened up a little bit and it is kind of like red and juicy looking. But uh, no, nah, for the most part, it's it's all good. And somebody's at my door. I wonder who that is. That's good timing. Or it's great. Not gonna get to come it's in. Grayson. It's Grayson. He wants to borrow a couple of sugar, cup of sugar. No, I guess. Grayson doesn't want to come back to this side of the this side of town. My brother, <laughs> he moved out. He's in. Uh, he's in the uh, high rent uh, district now. In, what's that? Is he in the high rent district now? Yeah. No, he moved. He moved up big time. Doubled. Uh, his house is sick. His house is super badass that he got with his girlfriend. <laughs> and now it's just just old me here in the uh, 
in the crib by myself talking to you guys now. So really been a downgrade. <laughs> yeah. Oh, talking to us is a downer. Huh? Talking to us is a downer. No, not downer, downgrade. It's a downgrade. He could yeah. be talking to other people much better than us. I don't know what's worse. <laughs> No, I I only, my brother's kicking ass. My brother's, he's, dude, he's doing badass. He's working at this place down here uh, in Kingwood, Texas, for anybody that wants to know. Uh, working at this place called Kenneth's Car Care. And he's 25. I think he's been working there since he was 23. Um, but he's been the manager of all of everything there. All the employees. I think there's like, I think there's like 30 employees. Uh, and he's been managing it for two years. And they have like up their they're uh like every month they're they're making like i don't know way more than they used to i think they're making like two hundred thousand a month right now in profit and before they were like negative most of the months wow. so from my brother being only 25 and having managed for the last two years and turned it around like he did i'm super impressed and i definitely couldn't have done that so so props right. to grayson he's killing it so he's the grayson. smartest of the gerlock boys 100 percent. look at me what do you what do you what do you look mean? at me it's look at even me. A, it's even a question <laughs> okay speaking of looking at you yeah i i when i saw the photos of you on social media before the season started i had oh. to like i had to like get other glasses i had to like show somebody else i had to restart my phone because i thought i was being duped by by photoshop right what how did you turn yourself into Arnold Schwarzenegger so quickly? <laughs> well, I definitely am not good at Photoshop, but I do know people that I paid to, uh, to do that. So, <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know. I, I was really annoyed with stuff that happened last year and uh, I needed something to do. And that was kind of what I, what I did is I just tried to uh, torture myself as much as I could uh, over three months. And I ended up, in a pretty good place uh and like i've actually been able to maintain it pretty well which i'm happy about um so i've been i kind of like i just like tinkering with stuff including right. me <laughs> so yeah. it's like uh you know whether i'm at the kart track riding my r3 or at the motocross track uh i like messing with suspension or geometry stuff like that uh same thing when it comes to nutrition and diets and stuff so i've definitely been around the block tried a ton of different diets over like the last I don't know, since like 2015, I've, I've kind of been interested in it my whole life, but 2015 is when I really started uh, tinkering a lot. So like I've tried a bunch of different stuff. I've tried, uh, tried being vegetarian before. I've tried uh, like doing paleo diet. Uh, I've tried ketogenic diet. I've tried, uh, what else? Um, I've I did carnivore for like a month. That was interesting. Um, but hmm. I'm kind of stuck on like what, what I've been doing since the end of last year, since December last year, uh, is kind of an animal based diet. So I'm sure you guys have heard of liver King. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not doing like a liver King diet, but there's another guy that does associate with liver King. Uh, his name's Paul Saladino. And I think on Instagram, he's the carnivore MD, something like that. Um, and it was an interesting concept. Like the stuff he talks about is interesting. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a scientist or any, like anybody to back it up. So I have no idea, but, uh, it just kind of made sense what he was talking about. So I, I decided to try to try it out and I've been really kind of happy with, with where I sit, like how I feel, uh, the results that I've seen, like in just body composition and stuff, like have been super positive. And so, so yeah, that's kind of been, that's kind of been where I'm at. And I, I like get my blood checked every three months, uh, just to, just to have like a database of like, you know, what I did the last three months. Here's what everything says. Like, I don't know. After being around motorcycles for so long, just having data seems like a good thing. And if you have data over a lot of years, then then you can kind of like really tune in and hone in on on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Well, Sean and I were thinking about trying it, but <clears throat> we started and then. The line of girls around the house got to be the point where it's so long we decided to go back to our regular diets yeah really exactly. yeah oh dude i haven't had that at all it's just a bunch of guys interested in fitness that are around my house. <laughs> that's the worst thing dude the worst thing about it is that i well at least for me i hadn't seen the girls line up but i get a lot of messages from guys asking like oh bro that's that's cool like can you help me out I'm like dude 
That's not who I, you know, that's not who I was hoping to hear from. <laughs> you, know, you would say in your carnivore diet, I, I have half of that. I not carnivore, not carnivore, animal based. Anyway, sorry. Okay, because I basically subsist on beef jerky and diet Mountain Dew. Maybe I have half of that, right? Is half that- of it, I would say, is pretty good. You just got to cut out the beef jerky. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, because I was gonna I was gonna ask you when you said animal based, I was thinking, okay. Uh, not to get weirdly scientific here, but since you know this stuff, I thought you were talking about B vitamins and amino acids, which are real good for recovery. Is that what you're referring to with animal diet, animal based diet? No. Well, I mean, I was just thinking that animals live in the mountains, so you can't cut that out. Where are they going to live? Oh, I see. What you're <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Look, look, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm dumb. Uh, you live like an animal. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm dumb. I just listen to people that seem to be smarter than me. Uh, and so if you, if you guys want any info, I'd go check out their stuff because they actually know what they're talking about. If I just repeat it, I'm going to repeat it wrong and it's going to probably not look as, as appealing. So, uh, I don't know the science behind it, but I like the results that I've gotten and I just stick the, the thing is, it's like, um, red meats basically. So that's kind of the, the foundation, let's say, uh, and it has something to do with like, you want to eat red meat from an animal that has more than one stomach. Don't ask me why, I don't know. Uh, so there's like, so there's that aspect. So that's like cows and stuff like elk. Uh, um, and then there's like raw dairy, which seems to be a big part, uh, raw honey. Um, uh, white rice can be every once in a while, which I do because I like, I like some kind of grain or like, I don't know, I can't just do, I can't just do like meat, fruit, honey and milk. I need something. So I, I have white rice every once in a while. But, uh, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of it. No vegetables. So no more sweet that. potatoes. No sweet potatoes. I, I think sweet potatoes could be a part of it, but I just, I haven't had any vegetables. And like I said, I do get my blood checked every three months and everything looks primo. So, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's something, uh, something to what, he, to what the guy's saying. It does kind of make Thank sense you. because um, in the animal kingdom in the, or in the, the natural world, like everything has a way to defend itself, let's say. So animals, for the most part, some of them have poison and whatnot, but like the ones that I eat specifically, uh, like like cows, elk, stuff like that, um, the way they defend themselves could is something they do physically. So their size or antlers, something like that. Um, but plants, the only way they can defend themselves uh, is from the chemicals that they produce to stop or to... Um, uh, persuade animals not to eat them, let's say. So an right. animal, an animal eats a plant, makes them feel horrible. More than likely, they're not going to go back and eat it again. Uh, let's say. And so, yeah. So if you like overload on plants, let's say, let's say you eat a lot of vegetables, the, I guess what the guy says, is the, the potential to, um, to like have all these different plant chemicals that are trying to get you to not eat them build up in your system yada 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 i don't know i'm kind of talking out of my ass right now um but uh yeah i guess that could be a negative and i uh, yeah i don't know so my blood work looks yeah. good i feel good so that's all i really need to know well all i know is when i have a salad i make sure there's no poison ivy on it so you know wow. that's I- a good that's probably good i don't think it would affect me though I, I used to go with Cameron Bobe all the time, riding mountain bikes and stuff. And every time, I swear, he would get poison oak or poison ivy. I remember that. Yes. He'd, be, he'd be covered in it. And I would follow him right through whatever he was riding through. And I'd be like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, I, I'm fine. <laughs> Once you get so, it, you're more susceptible to getting it again. So that's probably yeah. the deal. So I'm going right. to stick to what I do. I ride my bicycle. I do 100 push-ups every other day. And I drink beer. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a program. And I'm, and I'm old. You, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Heard that. Um, Seen that. Hey, hey, Garrett, I got a couple questions for you. So, well, first of all, back to real quick about Grayson. Does he still have, is he same girlfriend? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think they've been dating for over 10 years now. So it's going back to common law marriage. <laughs> all right. Well, good, good uh-huh. man. I'm glad yeah, he's hanging yeah, they're they're doing they're both doing good. Actually, Lauren Lauren, his girlfriend's doing uh doing really well. She's got an awesome job working from home, making bank. They're both making bank, dude. And good. so I'm feeling pretty left behind. Good. Well, no, let it be carry. It's all good. Yeah, no. Okay. Here's the thing: is that Grayson lived with me in in this house for five years, uh, and I tried my 
damnedest to get him to pay rent. Uh, he never would. And so he got five years basically rent free. So I have that in my back pocket for when, you know, it, inevitably I'm going to end up on the street one day. And so when that <laughs> happens, at least I know I have at least five years of rent free living with him because he owes me. We've always got a bed for you here, Garrett. Oh, dude, I, I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Oh, also uh, interest and inflation. So let's make that six years and two months. There you go. Very good. You guys see you know, who's now don't say you're not smart because listening, you do rip, rip that off. Plus, I also learned something from you today. And I think you were talking about that track in the Czech Republic that I thought was called most. But did you say it's called Moth? Most, Most. Most. OK, Most. OK, so I, I don't I know. I, I just I just go off of how other people say it. I'm like, I, I'm not going to be the only guy that says it different. So he's right most of the time. I think there's a chance you got it right if you're saying it the way everybody else is. But I anyway, look, I, I'm not from there. I don't know their pronunciation. So, all right, I'm going to go with what everybody else is saying. Yeah, it's probably right. So I think it was at that round. I, I can't remember because you guys have had such a long break now. But I think I got to ask you, what the hell happened with that tire? Oh, I, yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I popped two of them. Like, I popped, I popped it in race one and race two. And like, I think initially they were thinking that the curbs were sharp and stuff, but I mean, it's not that I, I had, uh, like everybody was using chunks out of their tire. And so, which is super weird because the track is the same. Uh, it's the same surface besides the first two corners as the year before where we were running the softest compound, which was an X and nobody had any problems, no chunking, nothing like that. We go back and they won't let us use the softest compound, the X. We have to use a zero or other like variations of the zero. Uh, and everybody has chunking problems. So like, I don't really know how that happened, but um, yeah, race one, I crossed the finish line and the tire pops in the, in, uh, in the first race. And so I did the cool down lap on the rim basically, uh, which was exciting. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and then in the second race, same thing. Uh, I exited the last corner. The thing felt like weird, uh, exiting the last corner. definitely felt like the thing squatted a decent amount and I thought it was funny. And then I started fishtailing down the straight, taking the white flag. And I was like, dude, you gotta be freaking kidding me. Cause I was, uh, I was closing in on, on fifth place or yeah, I was in, I was in six. I was closing in on fifth place, which I was yeah. pumped about. Huh? Yeah, exactly. I remember this. Yep. Go. Yeah. So I was, I was like pumped that I was closing in on fifth. It's like the, the best race that I've had this year. Unfortunately, it sucks to say that, but like, that's, that's how it is. Um, and was looking forward to getting six. Cause I wasn't, he was, uh, Basani was still too far up the road to, to actually catch him, but I was catching him. And, uh, and then going across the, the the finish line taking the white flag for the last lap the thing starts fish tailing and i'm like dude you have to be kidding me and then i go to turn into turn one and the thing steps out super big and uh i know i mean i knew immediately that the tire popped and i just like couldn't believe it i was like there's no there's no way right now like there's no way and um and so i did the last lap which was pointless because i was doing my best to keep speed up but i couldn't i ended up crossing the line in 18th and uh and that was uh that was a wrap on the weekend so uh not ideal but uh, sometimes sometimes it's just, that's just how things go so you just gotta accept it and uh and just keep pushing so garrett when you say the tire popped uh are, and you well, mentioned chunk, you mentioned it chunk Okay, but it's not getting a puncture in it. Is it losing air on, on the bead? Do you know? Does it get a hole in it? Does it wear down to the cords? What's the deal there? No, I just you. I I don't know because I'm not a tire engineer. But the chunk, it's like the, the tire was losing rubber, like chunking. Yeah. Um, and then there's like bubbles that pop up in between the like the main layer of rubber and what's below it, uh, the cords and stuff. And I don't know, air can just seep through the cords or seep through. I don't know. So it was, it was seeping, but the first race, it seemed a lot slower than the second race. The second race, it just like all seemed to come out in about 10 seconds. So, uh, so yeah, it uh, was unfortunate. Yeah. Um, sorry to my team. Cause I, I, two rims are not in as good of shape as they were before. So, oh. uh, but you know, 
Yeah. You had, keep, you had to keep going. It's understandable. Okay. Paul is only allowing me to ask you one more question here, Garrett. And you know, I can go on forever. Let's hear I'm, it. Let's hear it, Sean. Okay. I'm ready for anything. Oh. Okay. So, and this isn't, I already dropped the bomb when I asked you about the Pachetti Kawasaki thing. You got past that. Great. So this next one isn't so bad, but you obviously okay. know that Portimao, the final round of the season, I believe, uh, the attack team is going to come over with Jake Gagne on a full world superbike spec bike with that tr crazy transmission and the, the neutral lockout that you guys use. And yeah. how do you feel about that? I'm pumped. Like I, I, I heard that was happening and I was thinking like, really? Like, there's no way, like, really? And then I saw the press today so, and I was just pumped. Like, it's going to be cool to see, uh, to see the attack team over there. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to see what the bikes looks like, you know, um, and, and everything. I'm, I think, uh, did Jake ride that track back in the day? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he's got, he's got some laughs around there. So, you know, I'll be curious to see, you know, what he says about the track on it, riding a different bike there and, and like how the Pirelli's work and everything. And he's definitely, I mean, he's, he's riding super good in Moto America right now. So I know he'll be in top form when he comes over and I'm going to do my best to try to stay in front of him for sure. Right. <laughs> but I mean, I know Richard and, and those guys, they got a hell of a program and, and I know they got something to prove. So uh, yeah, we'll see, but I want to be in front. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got to obviously give you motivation. You know, you're excited to have them over there, but at the same time you want to for sure be in front of them and, be, be, and beat those guys, obviously. So yeah, hopefully, I mean, it's all friendly competition, um, but I also want them to do well. So ideally I'm first and they're second. Yeah, right. because then everybody, wins. then everybody wins like i did well and he did well i was in front though like i don't know yeah we'll see so, so you'll be back in action not this weekend but the same weekend that we're in new jersey and i'm sure you're looking forward to it because you've been off the bike for a while um, yeah yeah right. looking forward to it a lot i've been trying to ride as much as i can here just like riding motocross and stuff and and that's been good but uh yeah i fly back monday like you said earlier and and then I basically leave Wednesday to drive to, uh, to the track six hours. So, uh, going to be a quick turnaround. Uh, luckily I've been getting used to time changes, uh, real quick lately. So no problems there. And I just have my fingers crossed that it's not going to be just a washout weekend. Cause you know, France around this time seems to be uh, kind of a question mark when it comes to weather. Hmm. Wow. Okay, Garrett. So good luck to you there. And uh, like I said, we'll be in New Jersey and thanks for being on with us. We appreciate it. You're like I said, you're pretty elusive these days, but I'm glad to know that you still want to spend some time talking to us. And you gave us a lot of really good insights today. Paul and I always enjoy talking to you. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, I'm going to wrap up by saying to the fans, so we'll be at New Jersey, as we mentioned, and then we have a week off and then we'll be at Barber. But for those two last rounds of the season, we hope to see you there at, at one or both of them for sure. New Jersey, the ticket sales we've heard are very brisk this year. Obviously, we're wrapping up um, King of the Baggers. It's their last round and race of the year. And probably some other classes are going to be decided too. it looks like Super Sport may wrap up possibly uh, stock 1000, but there are still races that are going to be decided, including the main one, which is the Medallia Superbike Series, which is probably going to go all the way to the final race at Barber. So it's an exciting season for us and we're excited to bring it to you and can't wait to uh, see you guys at the track and come and talk to Paul and I. We love it when the fans come up and say, hey, we listen to your podcast and um, we always appreciate that. So again, thanks, Garrett. And uh, Paul, we'll talk to you. Okay. Thank you, Garrett. No worries. Thank you, guys. Peace, Peace out. Bye.